Okay, I'm John Bodden, professor of history at the University of Montevallo, and I'm here with, well, I'm going to let her introduce herself. My name is Demi Martinez Tollison, and I am a freshman at the University of Montevallo. All right, and Demi, I know you've been uh, doing some research about uh, a major labor dispute in 1920, the Alabama coal miner strike of 1920. And before we talk about what happened, I I'd like you to talk just a little bit about the history of labor organiz organizing in the state of Alabama leading up to the strike. All right, so labor unions in Alabama, specifically surrounding coal fields and um, ironworks, etc., happened, you know, around the industrial age with the rest of the country in the 1870s. The Knights of Labor had good ideals, but they were kind of wishy-washy with carrying it out, and so a lot of people kind of got fed up with them, and um, then they became like the United Mine Workers of Alabama. Something interesting to note um, that didn't quite make it into my paper is the fact that the United Mine Workers of Alabama was not originally associated with the United Mine Workers of America, which um, started in Ohio three years previous. So let's talk, let's talk about the, the immediate lead up to this coal strike in 1920. What was happening in the United States and in Alabama in, in the, the three years before the strike? Okay, so starting off in 1917, there are, there's World War One, and then there is like the, like the Russian Empire becoming the um, USSR, and there are kind of like a lot of emotions surrounding um, like leftist movements, and unions kind of get like included in that. So some people were just like automatically against unionization. They thought it went against the American ideals of like individualism and capitalism. So um, unions were already kind of working against that stigma. African Americans were really like stereotyped as being strike breakers um, and like the operators would um, bring them in even from like other states and stuff. The coal companies, the operators of the coal companies. Yeah. yeah. And so that created animosity between white and black workers that they kind of just like, they let it, they let race divide them when if they had worked together like more, like they could have overcome like the class struggles that they were all collectively facing. So, so you're saying that there was, there's, there's a class dynamic, but there's also an important racial dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, the white miners were just largely racist. So um, black miners were driven kind of into the arms of the um, coal operators because they could secure their own jobs while like these people who were just like rude and racist to them were like losing their jobs, like they were taking their jobs. Um, but the United Mine Workers of America in Alabama actually tried to like fight against uh, racism a little bit. Uh, so previous unions like the um, Greenback Labor Party, the Knights of Labor, um, they were they had both black and white workers, but they were definitely segregated. Um, there weren't a lot of uh, black miners in positions of power, etc. The United Mine Workers went out of their way to recruit black miners so that they wouldn't become strike breakers. So they knew what the um, operators were pulling. And they were trying to like preemptively, like work against that. The coal companies are, are they understand this wedge issue? They understand how they can exploit the issue of race to their advantage, and then the 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 unions are, are trying to counteract that and preempt that. Okay, could you could could you say like anything about the membership? Was the membership majority white of the United uh, Mine Workers? Yeah. So originally, um, like at the start of the twentieth century. 1903-ish, uh, I think. Uh, it was like a majority white. However, after the failed strikes of 1904 and 1908, there was kind of an exodus, mostly of white miners. And so a lot of like the black miners stayed, and so about 75% to 80% of the United Mine Workers of America were black workers. Okay, well let's, let's talk about uh, the strike. So how does this break out um, and then talk a little bit about people involved. Okay, so in 1917, um, the United Mine Workers of America, they wanted a pay raise. And so like they did like a couple of strikes and 
the operators were like, okay, we'll give this to you, but we're not going to enter into like a meeting, we're not going to negotiate with you. All right, in the 1918, um, the United Mine Workers were like, hey, we need another like raise, also, we want you to recognize us as a bargaining power. We're like 25% of the miners at this point. So we have like a substantial voice. We represent a large population of your workers. And the operators were like, no, we're not going to do that. And we're also not going to give you your raise. So the United Mine Workers of America went on a national strike in 1918. And it actually drew... Um, like the president's attention and he put together the bituminous coal commission and um, they looked into it and they were like okay coal operators you need to like give them a raise and it would be beneficial if you like bargained with some of them and they didn't mention the united mine workers like by name but the language implied that it was like they needed to like bargain with an entity large enough to represent a good chunk of their workers. And the United Mine Workers of America were kind of the only viable option at that point. And so the coal operators were like, okay, we're going to give them a raise. We're still not going to recognize them. And so in 1920, I think it kind of just boiled over. So, um, like the president of the National United Mine Workers, um, John L. Lewis, he was like, okay, um, on September 1st, he was like, we have an intention to start a strike September 7th at midnight, all right, if you do not like meet our demands. And so that week leading up to it was just incredibly contentious. Like there wasn't a lot of violence until September 6th, but it was just like the news, the way the news was writing about it, they were like, oh, like, no violence so far. And then on September 6th, when there was violence, they were like, first blood. And I just thought that was a very strange headline, like, first blood. Um, what happened? T talk about the, the violence. So, so the miners go on strike, uh, and what happens? All right. So the miners... Um, aren't like officially on strike yet. They're not like moving as a unit, but a lot of them are like slowing down production. A lot of them like in individual places are like going on strike. Um, and so I think it was a place in Jefferson County. Um, so there were the, it, it involved four individuals, two of which were um, non-union workers, two of which were union workers. But oddly enough, it was a union and a non-union man that attacked a union and a non-union man. Uh, one of them was drunk, and he was just like, oh, you scab, and then they just kind of like, um, they were like, we were just trying to go to work, <laughs> and um, he just like attacked them, so. So that was the first incident when things got violent. Mm -hmm. That was September 6th, and then, um, then they did end up going on strike at midnight on September 7th, and so that was like the immediate like lead up to the strike. And let's talk about the strike itself. So uh, this is this is a major upheaval. What's happening? And 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 talk about how the gov the governor of the state uh, reacts, and law enforcement, and different perspectives. What the miners are doing. What the, what the press says about it. All right. So I think something else important to note about Governor Kilby is that originally he was a businessman. So he's approaching the situation from like a business point of view. He's going to be on the side of the operators. And so he strongly believes that he's being like entirely reasonable. He's like, okay, these operators have given you the raise you want. And so you're just like doing this because you want to be recognized. And the UMW is like, no, these are the conditions that we're working in. So, like, company towns were just, like, a complete monopoly in coal fields. Like, the company owned everything. They had, like, that I found incredibly surprising. That's just a, it's such a dystopian, like, concept of a town having its own currency. And then there's also the fact that they had their own company police who could, like, evict people and kick them out of town with a 24-hour notice. Like, that was declared, like, legal. You only had to give them a 24-hour notice. The UMW is like, yes, we want to be recognized, but here's why we want to be recognized. We want to be able to bargain on, like, behalf of these workers. But also, the, the people going on strike 
they're not directing it at the right place. Like I said, like they're directing it at like the scabs, they're directing it at the strike breakers, they're directing it at people who could be their allies if they weren't pushing them away. And um, so strike, so the, the companies bring in scabs, strike breakers, mm -hmm. um, and there's violence when when they're brought into the mines. And there's this specific instance, um, Leon Adler, he was the son of like, the CEO of the Corona Coal Company, and he was also a general manager at one of like the coal fields. And so I thought it was very interesting because some newspapers were saying that um, like he and the three deputies were in their car, they were unprovoked. But then if you flipped to page six, um, like, I think it was the Birmingham News literally said, um, like, the news does not distinguish between, uh, whether it was an ambush or whether it was, like, a pitched battle. So, they're kind of admitting to the fact that the way that they portrayed it as, like, they were just assaulted in their car was not accurate. You had the newspaper saying this, and then you had, um, historians saying, that the um, that Leon Adler actually attacked the miners unprovoked, but the miners were armed, so I'm not sure if I believe that either. Point being, they ended up in literally just a battle. They had guns. They like had like shelter where they were like like. So they're barricaded. Up. They're shooting at each other. Mm -hmm. And so Leon Adler ends up dead. And you can imagine how the public reacted to this. He was a millionaire's son. He was like respected in the community. He was like a businessman. Um, I think like the exact wording was like he had like potential. Um, there's that aspect to it, but then there's also the aspect that Leon Adler, before going after these people, um, he said that he he would paint the Union Hall red even if it had to be done in blood. Which is not what you expect to hear from a victim. He might have been looking for a fight, is what you're saying. He may have been looking for a fight, and also just the relationship between a general manager and the workers who are striking. Very contentious. And so it, it seems to me that you're, you're saying uh, public support for the, the strikers uh, evaporated with this battle and the death of a powerful, a powerful so, man's son. So the public didn't, or the public already did not completely side with the striking miners because it was coal, it was about to get cold, it was going to affect their lives. But after they did kill this person, public support did kind of dry up. Well, let's talk about, uh, so what do the, 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 the state authorities do about this situation? Um, you know, winter is coming. <laughs> There's the strike is on, and, and what happens? Okay, so after Leon Adler is killed, the public is outraged. There is, there's a lot of news coverage about it. Governor Kilby's like, um, he has a lot of connections with the owners of these coal companies. So he's like, okay, I have to do something. And so he deploys the National Guard, and um, Steiner comes in. Who's Steiner? He is um, the commander of the National Guard. And um, he comes in, he's like, okay, we don't want any trouble and we're not expecting any trouble. We are an unbiased, like, we are unbiased, we're just here to maintain the peace. And that is absolutely not true. <laughs> um, so he's he, on the side of the companies? He is very much so on the side of the companies, um, very much so antagonistic towards um, the strikers. Uh, some of the people, like, directly under him literally said, um, I think it was like, to hell with the law of the United States Constitution, I'm following Steiner's orders. Okay, so h how does it end? Let's talk about how this strike ends and then its consequences and legacies. So, I the strike started off with a bang, but it kind of just fizzled out. It was months long, it, there was just a lot of violence, and they weren't getting anywhere. Um, the strike did not significantly impact the like production of coal. People were just being um, laid off, and so finally, like the United Mine Workers were like, "Okay, we're just gonna have to like suck it up, hope that Governor Kilby um, gives us like something to work with, and we need to put an end to the strike now for like the good of everyone." They sent Governor Kilby a letter, 
and um, they were like, we will agree to whatever you write so long as uh, the operators do the same. And Governor Kilby was like, totally. And he just, he just, like, let the operators get everything they wanted. He did not give the United Mine Workers anything. So the United Mine Workers, in this, um, like, when they submitted to Kilby, they were like, all right, we have, like, a few requests. Like, the workers who striked, we would like it if they could get their jobs back so they can take care of themselves and their family. Um, we would like to be recognized. Uh, just, like, stuff like that. And, um... Yeah, they didn't get, they didn't any get anything. Mm -mm. So and it was a, a, a victory for the companies and a so, defeat for the workers. Mm -hmm. Not only were the workers not rehired, they were also blacklisted from like any companies in the area, so they couldn't find work elsewhere. And so the UMW like tried to support these people for like as long as they could, but it wasn't really sustainable. And so yeah, it was just a complete win for the companies, a complete loss for the workers. Okay, well, wrapping up, what, what are some of the, the consequences and legacies uh, for the future in Alabama? So the UMW was kind of, like, decimated. And I don't think unionization has recovered since. Um, you don't really hear, like, you don't hear about workers mobilizing in that kind of way, especially not in Alabama. So we're kind of starting to get some of that back with Amazon and Starbucks and the, uni and the unionization of like these companies, but we're still not where we should be. So you see it as, as a major blow to the labor movement in Alabama. Yes. Well, that's really interesting, Demi, and I want to thank you for, for, for talking with me about your research. Thank you for having me.